So as we were discussing last time, uh, you know, this, this uh, logical language, sentential logic that we've been dealing with up to this point is limited in how it can represent statements. And, and the limitation in some way keeps it from reflecting the internal structure of sentences in a way that's important for uh, assessing different logical properties of sentences and arguments, right? Sometimes because we aren't able to represent the internal structure of atomic sentences, we miss out on the validity of certain arguments. So here's some examples of that, right? So if we have here, all humans are mammals, Mark Phelan is a human, um, so Mark Phelan is a mammal, so that's this argument, right? Um, we, uh, that, that argument looks to be a valid argument, right? And so on um, Wednesday in your group work, I had you think about arguments like this, and we can see that this thing is valid uh, because you know essentially what it's saying is the first se sentence is saying something like this: all thing, all humans are mammals, so all H's belong in the category of M's. All humans are mammals, and then it's saying Mark Phelan is a human, right? So there's an individual here, M P, and then um, it follows from that that Mark Phelan is a mammal. If all of the humans are contained within the mammal category and Mark Phelan is contained within the human category, then it must be true that Mark Phelan is a mammal, all right? So this is a valid argument. It's not possible for those premises to be true without the conclusion being true. But if we try to represent this thing using sentential logic, what we end up with is actually just this. right, A, B, C. So sentential logic uh, prevents us from re reflecting the underlying uh, structure of this sentence in a way that shows why it's valid, why the argument is valid, right? Similarly with this next argument, Mark Phelan is happy, therefore someone is happy. Well, um, again, this looks like it's, it's true. So it's essentially saying that um, Mark Phelan MP is within the category of happy things, right? And if Mark Phelan's within the category of happy things, then something or someone is in the category of happy things. And so uh, that last sentence, which essentially says that the class of happy things is non-empty, is true. So it has to follow, if Mark Phelan is happy, that someone is happy, right? But again, if we try to represent this using the resources of sentential logic, what do we end up with? Well, all we end up with is, let's say this one is A, and this is B. What we end up with is A, therefore B. And of course, that doesn't reflect the validity of this argument either. So it seems like sentential logic is failing to recognize two things about this premise and this conclusion. So what is it failing to recognize? Well, first of all, it doesn't re reflect the fact that both statements are about the category of happy things or being happy, right? Notice when we put this into sentential logic format, all we get is these variables to stand in for the sentence. And as we know from discussion of sentence uh, letters earlier, um, the, the sentence letters, uh, are variables that represent any atomic sentence, right? So these sentence ladders abstract away from the category of happiness or the property of being happy, right? They just stand in for any atomic sentence whatsoever, right? Yet it is the rep repetition of the predicate is happy in the premise and the conclusion that's important for the validity of this argument. And then the second thing that sentential logic seems to be mounting, uh, missing out on here is that it doesn't offer a way to represent claims about someone or everyone, right? So it doesn't have um, a way to represent this property, someone, in this argument. And that seems important too, because that's effectively saying something about the class of things that are happy. Okay, so that argument, um, so sentential logic is missing out on some things that we need to really appreciate validity in some of its forms. Now, it's not to say that every argument that involves quantified statements or statements involving something or everyone or someone 
Um, it's not to say that every sentence that involves those words uh, or every argument that involves those words requires that we use predicates and quantifiers in order to um, represent the argument in a way that reflects its validity. Sometimes we can still show that an argument is valid without advent to quantifiers, even if the sentence involves uh, those quantificational words like someone or anyone or everyone or so on. So here's an example of that. So if we look at this argument, right, what does this argument say? Well, it says, if no one goes to the party, then everyone will miss out on my cupcakes. No one came to the party, therefore everyone missed out on my cupcakes. Right, this looks like a valid argument. What's more, in this case, we actually can represent this argument using sentential logic in a way that shows the validity, right? So suppose we say, um, uh, one goes to the party, so we'll treat that as someone goes to the party, so we'll call that A. Everyone will miss out on my cupcakes, call that B. Uh, no one came to the party. Again, that's just past tense, but it's the same content as one goes to the party, so we're just going to call that A again. And then down here we get B, and so now we can see that the structure of this argument looks to be the following. If it's not the case that A, then B. It's not the case that A, therefore B. This is just a straightforward example of um, modus ponens. So this argument is clearly valid. It involved um, words like everyone and someone, but those words weren't important to representing this argument in a way where, um, in a way that re uh, reflected its validity. But many arguments that do involve these quantifiers, uh, quantificational words like no one or someone, um, uh, actually do uh, need the quantifier structure to force to be able to represent their validity. So I've given you some examples before, but here would be another one of those examples. So, um, if no one goes to the party, then everyone will miss out on my cupcakes. So we have, again, someone goes to the party, um, and then everyone will miss out on my cupcakes. And then someone had one of my cupcakes, which is just a totally different sentence from what's come before. And then it follows that someone went to the party. Right, well, notice, these are all just different sentences now. So what this argument ends up looking like is it's not the case that A, therefore B, um, C, therefore D, right? If we just use sentential logic, we would not be able to reflect the validity of this argument in this case. So what we need is a way, again, of representing the, um, the uh, predications that are important to our arguments, like happy or um, had a cupcake or went to a party. And we need a way of ranging over words like someone and everyone, what a tool for representing those since they seem important to rendering arguments. Okay, so I want to turn now to a more general discussion of this material. So that's a basic recap. Are there any questions about the motivation whereby, um, or, or why we need to introduce these quantifiers at this point? Why they're going to be happy for us, or helpful for us, not happy for us. Okay, so then let's turn to this, uh, this presentation, talk through this a little bit more. Okay. All right. So uh, when we're talking about um, predicate logic, uh, that implies at least two uh, sorts of new symbols that we need to, to familiarize ourselves with. Okay. So one of those is what we might refer to as constants. That's what your book calls them. 
Um, I referred to them as names last time. But essentially what these things are, are labels for picking out individuals. So they're labels for referring to individuals. And as I mentioned last time, um, these uh, constants or names, we're going to use uh, letters, we're going to use letters from the left-hand side of the alphabet. So the first 13 letters of the alphabet, so A through M are going to be the letters that we choose to represent these things. A W appears here, but ignore that. I want you to go up through M. And then, well, what if you have more than 13 individual objects that you need names for, or need to refer to? Well, in that case, then we can go into subscripts. So we can just start over with A sub one, B sub one, and so on till we get to A sub two. And of course, since there are infinite numbers, we have an infinite amount of these names that we can use, okay? Predicates are another thing that are implicated in predicate logic, right? So before, for example, we noticed that the property of being happy was an important predicate for some of our arguments, right? So we need um, predicates to uh, represent or to stand for, to pick out different specific properties and relations. Okay, so notice predicates refer both to properties and relations, okay? So for example, if we have H sub A or H sub M, this might stand for Mark is happy. And so here, this is a kind of property, the property of being happy that's being attributed to me, Mark, okay? So predicates can represent properties, but they can also represent relations between items. So for example, we could have the predicate uh, loves, right? So we might have um, Alice loves Bob as a sentence of our language. And that would be represented in this way, again, using the predicate uh, L, for, to represent the property or the relationship of loving, right? And then what's being said here, if we take the names A and B to, to represent Alice and Bob, is that Alice stands in the love relationship to Bob, okay? So these predicates can represent, again, properties as in this case, or relations as in this case. This is a relationship that exists between Alice and Bob. Not, not a relationship in any like sophisticated or um, heavy uh, sense of that term, but it's just a relation, just like smaller than might be a relation or, um, or uh, richer than or uh, lives next to. All of those might be relations. Okay, and then of course the, the, the um, arity of these different predicates might go up, right? So last time we talked about, you know, this drives to predicate. And so um, I think the example was Liz drove a microbus to Burning Man. And I put those in caps, which I should not have. We always want to keep two of these names in lowercase letters, right? D L M B. And so this could stand for um, Liz drove a, uh, the microbus to Burning Man. Okay, um, and of course the arity of our predicates can go up even further than this. Um, so uh, Johnny played ball with Sam and Sally, right? Maybe we have a predicate that takes two indirect objects for it, right? That would be uh, a four-place predicate, 
Okay. Uh, in general, when we want to represent what a predicate stands for, we won't use names, but instead, instead we'll just plug in some variables there to say this is how many things are relevant for this predicate. So we can have hx, right, if we were making a symbolization key, right, we might say hx equals x is happy. Okay. Um, if we uh, wanted to represent um, our loves predicate, we might say lxy, x loves y. So in general, we're just going to use variables here when we describe what these uh, predicates mean. Okay. Now, we tend to use, logicians tend to use X preferentially and then Y and then Z when they're setting up a symbolization key like this. But those variables don't have to be the ones that you use when you're using these symbols. So later on, you may say something about someone loving someone else, right? Or someone loving everyone, let's suppose. And so that would look maybe something, you, you're welcome to use these variables. Um, I keep using the caps. Right, so that would say something like, um, there exists someone such that they love everyone, right? So any of those letters that occur in the last half of the alphabet can be used as variables here. And same rules as with, uh, as with names, if you need more than the 13 letters you're supplied, you can add in uh, sub subscripts to uh, make additional variables. Are there any questions about that basic machinery of um, predicates and variables? Sorry, predicates and names. Okay, so let's go on. Okay, so. Now, looking back at our previous arguments, you know, it was important that we represented the predicate in those different arguments. It was important to the argument, someone is, or Mark is happy, therefore someone is happy, that we, that we talked about the happiness relation, right? But that argument, and indeed many arguments we'll see in symbolic logic, also depend upon quantifiers, right? It said, if Mark is happy, or, or it said Mark is happy, therefore someone is happy. And that notion of someone is what I'm calling a quantifier here, okay? Um, so why do we need these things? Why do we need these quantifiers uh, that range over um, all different objects or some object within a domain? Well, the reason is that um, we can't simply represent all of the sentences that we need to represent for logical purposes using our connectives, names, and predicates, right? So for example, here we have uh, the predicate HX, which stands for X is happy, and we have several names here, N equals Neil, P equals Patty, and O equals Omar, right? So how do we, using these resources, say everyone is happy, right? Well, if the only people that are in our world are Neil, Patty, and Omar, we might attempt to represent everyone is happy with these resources by writing this, right? By writing um, H sub N or HN and HP and HO. But notice this sentence doesn't really represent the same thing as everyone is happy, right? Everyone is happy is in a certain sense less precise. It doesn't tell us who precisely is in a room. And it's also more precise because it tells us for everyone in that room or in this domain we're talking about, they are happy. So we need not only a means for representing individual objects and their properties, 
but also for making these more general statements about everyone in a certain domain. So we need quantifiers to allow us to represent things like everyone is happy. And the way we're going to represent that is in the following. We're going to say for all x, x is happy, okay? So for all things, x, right? These are the things that I'm gonna talk about at any point. Each one of those things has this property, the property of being happy, okay? So we can translate everyone is happy as for all x, happy x, right? And so partial, uh, translated partially into English, this would mean for all x, x is happy. Okay, so our universal quantifier is going to allow us to make these general statements, right? And it's important to note that it consists of two parts. It consists of the quantifier, right? In this case, all x for all things x, right? And it also uh, consists of a certain sentence that falls under the scope of that quantifier, okay? Um, so notice that the quantifier statement here consists not only of the quantificational symbol itself, but always, if it's going to be well-formed, it needs to have some variable attached to it, okay? So when you use the universal quantifier or indeed the existential quantifier, any quantifier, you're going to need to use a variable to say which gap or spot in the predicate the quantifier applies to, right? So this is telling us that the quantifier, the universal quantifier applies to any individual that ends up being represented with X later on, okay? So the all applies to that part of the predicated statement that occurs after the quantifier. Okay, like so for example, if we had all x, h, um, x, b, right, and suppose now that, that h stands for hates, okay, which is a two-place predicate, well, all x, right, the all here is only going to apply to the h, that is in the predicated statement, right? So we're saying for all things H, X hates B, right? So we're saying all the X's hate B, but we're not saying anything about all the B's. For one thing, B is a name, so it refers to a specific individual, okay? So that X just functions to tell us where we apply the universal quantifier, where we apply the all. Okay, so that's what the X is doing. Additionally, we will speak of a predicate as, um, or sorry, we'll speak of a quantifier as applying to a predicate or more than one predicate even, okay? And we'll say that whatever predicates the quantifier is applied to, and again, this thing is a predicate, whatever predicates the quantifier is applied to are within the scope of that quantifier, okay? And the quantifier, if it has the same variable um, as a variable that occurs in the predicate, binds, we'll, we'll speak of it as binding that space in the predicate, right? So the universal quantifier here binds X and does not bind B, okay? This is just to let you know on uh, some of the terms that I'll be using as I talk about these things. I think you'll get grow more accustomed to them uh, as we go along, okay? So with this statement, for all x, hx, in effect, what this universal quantifier is saying is any name you plug in for x in this predicate 
will render a true statement. Okay. So if I say for all x, hx, in effect, what I'm saying is any name you plug in to the predicate h will give us a true statement. If you plug in b, we'll get a true statement. If you plug in a, we'll get a true statement. If you plug in c, we'll get a true statement, and so on. So that's in effect what our universal quantifier is saying. And that's why it's called the universal quantifier. It's saying um, universally, whatever individual you plug in here, you'll get a true statement. Every individual in the domain we're talking about satisfies this predicate. This predicate is true of them. Okay, are there any questions about that? I know that's a lot of, a lot of uh, terminology coming at you, but it'll start to make more sense as we move along. Okay, so now consider the following quantified statement. Um, so this, here we have, uh, uh, this is our symbolization key. So we have a predicate L, X, Y, which stands for X loves Y. And we have a name B, which stands for Beyonce. So um, we can use these tools or these, uh, these uh, meaning elements, and also our quantifiers to represent uh, the following sentence. So we can say all x, l, x, b, which stands for, for all things x, x loves Beyonce. Okay, so b is gonna stand for Beyonce there. So again, for all things x, this quantified statement applies to any x that occurs in here. In other words, any name we can fill in for X, we should generate a true statement. In addition to our universal quantifier, we also have an existential quantifier. So this statement, for example, would say there exists some X such that X um, loves Beyonce, right? Um, and so what is this saying? Well, it's not saying that any name or any uh, individual you plug in for X will render a true statement, right? It's not saying like if we're talking about some world, it's not saying that every one of these things, you know, uh, it plugged into here is gonna give us something true, right? But it is saying that there is some individual out there, and maybe this individual is that individual, there's some individual out there for who it is true that they love Beyonce, okay? So the universal quantifier, if there was a universal quantifier here, that thing would say that any one of these you plug in will give us a true sentence. The existential is just saying there exists some individual out there for which we will get a true sentence if we plug that individual into the X spot. Okay, questions about any of that? So you'll notice in describing both of those, I talked about individuals in a world or in a domain that we're talking about, okay? And so this brings us to uh, the last key component for thinking about quantified statements, and that is a universe of discourse. Right now, it can't be that um, every, uh, right, so, so um, typically if we have a statement, right, like um, the following, all the beer is gone, Right, imagine that, uh, you know, um, I'm throwing a party and I walk to my party, I look in the fridge and I say, all the beer is gone. Well, uh, presumably you think I'm speaking something truthfully, right? And I may be speaking something truthfully in that case, but if I am, it's not because all beer has ceased to exist in the universe. It's because all the beer in my fridge is gone, right? So typically when we talk, 
even if we make these kind of quantified statements about everything or something, we're not really talking about everything simpliciter or something specifically in the universe in general. Instead, there's always some specific domain of individuals that we're talking about, or there generally is. We don't generally mean everything in the universe, okay? So oftentimes, in assessing whether or not a sentence is true, we need to be mindful of what the universe of discourse is. What are the things that we're talking about, right? If the universe of discourse is restricted to my refrigerator, then this claim may be true, but it seems to be false if our universal universe of discourse is the whole world, okay? So every quantified claim is going to be assessed relative to some universe of discourse, and you need to include this idea of the universe of discourse, the things we're talking about, within your symbolization key. Typically, when you and I are discussing something or we're talking, and there is a way in which my uh, claim is supposed to be restricted to a specific reference class, the way in which you know that restriction for my claim is entirely contextual. It's because um, of uh, the kind of context that we're in that's going to specify what this is. It's not entirely contextual. I may say, uh, you know, I may make it part of the semantics. So I may say at the beginning of our discussion, consider all of the students at Lawrence. In that case, I have explicitly determined a universe of discourse, right? But oftentimes we'll know the universe of discourse, not because I've explicitly stated it, but because of contextual cues that we've used, like me standing in front of my refrigerator uh, saying all the beer is gone. The contextual cue there is where I'm located and what I'm looking at, okay? But of course, in logic, we want to be very precise about what we're talking about. So again, you need to add UD and specify what the universe of discourse is for the domain that you're talking about. Okay, so what do you say what the universe of discourse is? So in this case, it might be things in the fridge. And really, the most uh, helpful way to lay out a universe of discourse is not by thinking about uh, so like a gap of space or something. Like, so I wouldn't say the universe of discourse is the fridge, typically. I would say, talk about objects. I would say the stuff in the fridge. Okay, so going back a little bit, if we think about this sentence, for all x, um, L, X, B, this sentence um, may have very different truth values depending on what the universe of discourse is. Um, if the UD equals uh, people in the world, this sentence is presumably false. But if uh, the universe of discourse equals members of the Beyonce fan club, then presumably, or at least perhaps, this sentence may be true, okay? So the domain of discourse is going to make a difference as to what's true or not. Okay, so bearing this in mind now, well, first of all, are there any questions about any of this material so far? Okay, well then in that case, I want us to spend the rest of today practicing with some of these materials and uh, translating both from symbolic logic, from quantified logic into English, and translating uh, from English into quantified logic. So the first thing I wanna do is think about these example arguments before. So there are a variety of different um, sentences that we had here. And so I want us to uh, take turns talking about um, which of these sentences are meaningful, um, or how, sorry, how to represent these sentences using uh, 
the resources of quantified logic. So let's see. So I think our participants today are um, Owen. So I'm going to put a little O here. Um, just looking at these from uh, what I have presented to me. Um, Sam, that's going to be you. Um, Nicole, this will be you. Simon, that'll be you. Callista, that's you. And Abby, that's you. And then we'll flip over. O, S, N, A, O, S, N. Shit, sorry. Um, uh, Simon, I'm going to call you I for your second letter so I can remember who's who here. Um, o S N A I. Okay, so I'd like you to translate each of these for me based upon uh, where you fall in this. So, Owen, you're going to go first. How would we translate all humans are mammals? I'll write it down if you can describe it to me. Universal quantifier. M. Right, universal quantifier for all X. XM. Okay. XM, like this? You mean MX, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, so if the predicate, the, quanti the variable is always going to come, or the variable or the name is always going to come after the predicate. So for all right. X, MX, okay? Do you need to tell me anything else? So uh, let's see, what would our symbolization key be for this one? What does MX stand for? Is a mammal. X is a mammal. And what's our universe of discourse? Humans. Okay, so UD is humans. All humans. Okay, so this is a way to represent this argument because you are using a clever uh, uh, domain of discourse. And it may be that this would work well for purposes of our argument. Um, but in fact, uh, we actually need some more structure here. And, and that becomes clear actually if we think about um, our next sentence. So um, Sam, how would you paraphrase this next sentence? Um, so I would do, um, H equals is a human. Okay. And then I would do, let's say, so remember we have to put a little variable in. We're oh, okay. So H X equals X is human. Okay. Um, and then I would do, uh, lowercase M equals Mark Phelan. Okay, so HM like this? Yeah. Okay, yeah, and so we need to know that name to, oh, you were, I'm sorry, you were doing this, sorry about that. Yeah, and so this is how presumably you would translate this guy, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean now, like this seems weird because our domain of discourse is human, so why do we have to spec specify that Mark is a human? Um, well, because M wouldn't be a grammatical sentence for one thing, right? So we needed that predicate. And so, and actually for this argument, for this argument to be validly represented, this predication of humanness is important for the form of this argument. So we actually want to shy away from the strategy that Owen took here of making our domain of discourse include all and only humans. Um, instead, we want to adopt something like the strategy that Sam used of using a human predication, okay? And so if we have a human predication, then that's going to change how we represent the first sentence too. So in fact, what's actually gonna end up being represented here is something like this. For all x, if x is human, then X is a mammal. And now look, all of this, 
falls under the scope of this quantifier. Okay, so all of these X's, the all applies to all of them. The reason is because this quantifier is attached, is like glued on to the front of this sentence. Okay, so it's going to, its scope includes everything within the parentheses. Now, if we had this sentence for all X, HX, then M, M. In this case, this thing does not fall under the scope of this quantifier. Why not? Can anyone explain that? Why this thing doesn't fall under the scope of that quantifier? Because it has a different subscript? Right, so, so you might think it's because it doesn't have, because it has this thing here, because it uses a different, um, uh, it uses a constant instead of a quantifier, but also in this case. Because it's not under the parentheses like the above one? Right, because it's not, it's not part of a sentence that this is directly modifying, right? So you might think of it on the model of negation, right? If we have negation HX, this means it's not, if it's not the case that HX, then M. Whereas this thing means it's not the case that if HX, then M, right? So quantifier rules are going to bind in the same way that negation binds. Quantifiers are going to bind just like negation binds. They're going to apply to the same objects. And the, I mean, the same spread of objects that occur after them as negation would. Um, in fact, this sentence that I just wrote out, all x, hx, then mx, is not uh, a well-formed formula. It's not a well-formed sentence because we have an unbound variable. This X isn't bound by any quantifier. That's why I changed it to M before. Um, but that gives us another reason why all X doesn't apply to that, to M, M. Okay, so back to this. So we have as our first sentence for all X, if X is H, then X is M. So this sentence, all humans are mammals. Um, this, this is a, a kind of sentence in a special kind of logical form. It's one of four Aristotelian forms. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. But um, essentially, if we want to say all S's are P, the form that that sentence is always going to take is all X, SX, then PX. So all S's are P will always take this form. For all things, if they fall into this one category, then they fall into this other category. And so here we're saying, for all things X, if X is a human, then X is a mammal. What about the second sentence here? Well, actually Sam represented this one uh, clearly before. Mark is a human. And then what is our conclusion here? Uh, Nicole? Um, I, this sentence. Uh, is it just MX? Not MX because we're talking about an individual, right? It's not a variable, there's a name. Oh, is it lowercase m or yeah? Uh, yeah, is it m, m? M. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is how we'd represent the sentences in this argument using predicates and quantifiers. And in fact, this argument turns out to be valid. Um, we will be developing rules for dealing with quantifiers that will allow us to prove this conclusion as following from these premises. Okay, Simon, how would we represent this sentence? Why don't you go ahead and set us up with a, uni a universe of discourse too? 
Uh, I think on that one, the universe of discourse is people. Okay. All people? Yeah, I think so. Okay, sure. All people. By the way, universe of discourse is important for assessing the truth of a sentence, but it's not important for assessing the validity of an argument. So why is that? Can anyone guess why? Because if the argument is valid, the validity of an argument means that it is true regardless of the universe of discourse. Right, exactly. Right. Universe of discourse is akin to a world. And so if I say an argument is valid, I'm saying there's no way for these premises to be true while the conclusion is false. There's no world where these premises are true and the conclusion is false. So it matters less for that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, here we get, um, but, but it does matter for assessing truth. Okay, so we have all people here as our universe of discourse. And then uh, what else do you want yeah. to introduce to? Uh, capital H of X is X is happy. Okay, all right. And then I think lowercase m being Mark Phelan. Good. And then it's just, yeah, capital H, lowercase m. Uh-huh. Okay, and then Callista, what about this next sentence? That'd be um, X is central quantifier X, and then HX. Okay. So X is central quantifier X, and then HX. Good, that's right. And so this too is valid. This is actually a valid argument we could show with one step. You're just gonna use an existential introduction rule here. And that just says, hey, if something has a property, if some specific thing has a property, then you can assert that something or other has that property. Okay, so you just cite like M there. All right. Well, that's actually one of our patterns of inference. We'll skip over, well, actually, no, let's do this one. So if no one goes to the party, then everyone will miss out on my cupcakes. Well, it is possible for us to represent this, as I mentioned before, as if A, then B. But um, Abby, I want you to try to represent the quantified structure of this thing. I'm not going to lie. I don't know where to go with this. Okay. All right. So um, the important thing to note here is, first of all, that there are a few quantifiers that are involved in this, okay? Mm -hmm. So one is that's no that. one, and one is everyone. So that's going to be the universal quantifier for the everyone. Mm -hmm. And then for the no one, would it be a not and the universal quantifier? Not, uh, it's a not, and then not a universal quantifier, but an existential quantifier. <laughs> Right. So um, <laughs> think of it this way. If I'm saying no one does something, that's akin to saying it's not the case that there is someone who does something. Okay. Right. It's different from saying it's not the case that everyone does something. Okay. Right. So it's not the case that everyone does something is consistent with someone doing something. But if we want to say no one is doing something, then we want to say it's not the case that someone is doing that thing. Mm -hmm. Couldn't and it's you an also? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Couldn't you also say that for everyone they don't do the thing? Um, yeah, you can also say that. That's okay. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so this the way we're going to represent this one. This one is a very tricky one. You got the hardest one so far, Abby. <laughs> So yeah, I saw that. <laughs> the way we're going to represent this one is we can do it two ways. So Simon points out, so we can do it this way. It's not the case that there exists some X such that PX, such that X goes to the party. Or we can also say for all X's, they don't go to the party. And both of these are truth functionally equivalent. Okay. Okay. 
I mean, think of it this way. I'm saying it's not the case that someone does this thing, or I'm saying uh, it's not the case that any, like the, the first one is saying it's not the case that any one individual does this thing. The second one is saying for all individuals, they do not do this thing. So those two things are logically equivalent, right? Mm hmm that makes sense. Um, yeah, and so what this one actually is going to look like is, so we have this first clause, which we've identified here, for all x, it's not the case that px. So um, for all things, they don't go to the party. And we can just say our domain of discourse here, continuing from above, is all people. Um, then, And now we have another quantifier built in here for all y, m y, y misses out on my cupcakes. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we would represent that one. Okay, what about no one came to the party, Owen? Would it just be a universal quantifier X negation PX? Yep. That's right. So it's going to be equivalent to this thing. And then this would be what? AYMY. And so this is derivable again because of modus ponens. Right, so we could derive this simply by citing uh, conditional limb M and N. Okay. All right. Uh, good job with that. I want us to skip ahead to this next part. And I've got another meeting that's just started. So I'm going to have to do this and then we'll call it a day for today. Um, but I think this is a good intro to this. So once again, I'd just like us to repeat um, the same strategy as before. There's a couple of repeat sentences on here. So we got Nicole, Abby, um, Simon, um, Owen, Sam. This one we're going to skip. Um, Owen, Sam. Nicole. Actually, let's skip over this one too. This one we're going to skip too. Um, and then um, wait, actually, leave that one in, leave that one in. We're going to skip over this guy. This is a repeat. And that'll be it. So we got um, Nicole, Abby, uh, Simon, Owen, Sam, Nicole, Abby, uh, Simon. Okay, so what I want you to do is imagine that uh, the domain of discourse is all physical things. And these are our predications. X is larger than Y. Uh, LXY stands for X is larger than Y. SXY stands for X is the same size as Y. Uh, EXY stands for X eats Y, and FXY stands for X feeds Y. And so now I want you to think about the truth value of different of these sentences. Okay, so uh, Nicole, um, is this sentence true or not? The first sentence here. And you might, if you, if you want, um, you can try to read out the sentence to us and explain what it means. I, I don't know. Okay. So let's try to walk through this stepwise. All right. So how do we read this part? For all X. Okay. For all X. Good. And so then for all X, how do we read this? But there's, oh, X is the same size as X? Yep. Okay. 
Is that That's, true? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Because what does that mean in ordinary, in ordinary English? All, if something is the same size as itself? Yeah, everything is the same size as itself, right? So it's not just something, it's everything that that's true of, right? So that sentence is true. Every physical thing is the same size as itself. Okay, Abby, what about this one, the next one? Okay, um, so it's saying there exists at least one X uh -huh. where it's not the case that it's the same size as itself. Yeah. Perfect. Is that Which true? is false. That's false. Because everything's, it can't have two sizes. Right. Exactly. It's kind of the opposite of the sentence that we have above, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, well, this is actually to Simon's point earlier. Um, we could uh, represent the same thing by writing, it's not the case that for all x, s, x, x, right? All right, um, Simon, what's this one? Is this one true or false? I can zoom in a bit if it's uh -huh. Let's see, that one is saying that for all x and y, if s is, or if x is the same size as y, then y is the same size as x. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. For all things, x and y, if x is the same size as y, then y is the same size as x. Okay, Owen, what about this one? For an individual x and for an individual y, if uh, x is the same size as y, then x is not the same size as y, then y is not the same size as x. I right. don't see how that can be true. Right. Right. This is, I mean, um, you said for an individual, I find it a little more natural to say there exists something X and there exists something Y. Right. So it's saying that they're just out there. There's this pair of individuals, X and Y just, there just has to be one of them. But for this pair of individuals, X is the same size as Y, but Y is not the same size as X. And that has to be false because same size is a reflexive property. That just means if some object bears that relationship to some other object, then that other object bears a relationship to the first one. All right, Sam, what about this guy? All right, for all X, all Y, and all Z, um, X is larger than Y, and Y is larger than Z. Um, sorry. If it is the case that yeah. um, X is larger than Y and Y is larger than Z, then X is larger than Z. Yep. Is that true? Um, I mean, that seems to be true. Yeah. This one is capturing what's called the transitivity of the larger than relationship. So if X is larger than Y and Y is larger than Z, then X is larger than Z. Right? Notice larger than is a transitive relationship, but there are other transitive relations, there are other relationships that are not transitive, right? Think about if L stood for loves, right? So that would say if X loves Y and Y loves Z, then X loves Z. And that is not true. In fact, probably more often than not, the opposite is true. If X loves Y and Y loves Z, then X probably hates Z. So uh, this happens to be true because of the larger than predicate, because it's, it's um, a transitive predicate. Okay, Nicole, skipping down to that next one, what would you say about that? For all X and for all Y, X is larger than Y. Uh, if X is larger than Y, then Y is larger than X. Is that true? No. No. Right. Because larger than is not a reflexive relationship. If some object's larger than another, then it's not the case that that other object is larger than it. Yeah. Right. Unlike the being friends with relationship, right? Which may be, as we discussed earlier in the term, a reflexive relationship. 
All right, uh, Abby, how about this one? There exists some X and some Y uh, where if X is larger than Y, then it's not the case that Y is larger than X. Yep, is that true? That's true, right? Yeah. Yeah. There exists something such that if that thing is larger than some other thing, then the other thing isn't larger than it. In fact, that's true of every object that's larger than another object. Larger than another object. Okay, and the last one here, Simon. So what does this one say? Uh, that one says that for all x and y, if x eats y, then y feeds x. Okay, you said that as a then. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, if and only if. <laughs> yeah, right. so x eats y if and only if y feeds x. Yeah, is this one true? For me, that depends on the definition of feeds. <laughs> yeah. Because when I think feed, I think of like spoon feeding. Right. Or yeah, like yeah. serving a plate of food to someone, not necessarily being eaten by. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I think the so issue is. I that. would say no yeah. based on my definition of feed, but I could see a way in which that would be true. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there are two different senses of feeds that are in play here. Like if we're using feeds in an unrestricted sense where it takes in both of the meanings for that predicate, yeah, then uh, this is not true because, for example, well, it's certainly true that, um, you know, if uh, I eat a pizza, then the pizza feeds me, right? Yes. But it's not true that if I feed my cat, then my cat eats me, right? because I fed my cat this morning and I'm still here. So uh, it seems that it goes one way, even if we take a like broad scope or a broad meaning for feeds where it sweeps up both senses, but it doesn't go the other way. So it's not gonna be biconditionally true. The biconditional won't hold. 